So today I'm joined by Sean Johnson, partner at Founder Equity, a Chicago-based venture fund. Welcome, Sean. Nice to be here. Thanks. Absolutely. Now, one of the distinctive aspects of uh, Founder Equity is that there are no traditional management fees and that the general partners don't realize return until liquidity. Mm -hmm. So who's paying for the operating fee for the duration of the fund? Yeah, so uh, we um, have kind of a unique structure and we're able to do it because um, I'm also a partner in an innovation consulting firm called Digital Intent. And basically we funneled all of our profit for the last four years uh, into, um, into operating the fund. And so there's some nice synergies that it allows us to do. Um, obviously it allows us to pay for everybody. Um, it also allows us to have basically 100% uh, efficiency from an asset allocation perspective or from a, from a team allocation perspective because any of our bench time uh, that teams are not working on consulting engagements, they're, allowed, they're able to deploy inside of fund companies. And so for many fund companies, that's been material. We've been able to help them build out pieces of or um, in rare cases, uh, their entire sort of tech stack. We're able to help them from a digital marketing perspective. We're able to help from a design perspective as well. Um, and even sort of business development, things like that. So we, we created sort of a nice little symbiosis. Out to create was a venture fund that would provide, um, would be a, basically a value added fund. So you, you hear about like Andreessen's and things like that. Um, for them, in order to just, in order to be able to provide those kinds of resources, they have to raise very, very large funds because they're, they're, um, the structure is based off of the two off the management fee, right? And so, uh, by virtue of having the consulting business kind of on the side that's, that's paying for all of the team, we're actually able to provide, uh, to be a value-added fund uh, while, ra while having a much, much smaller fund size uh, relative to the amount of impact that we're able to kind of deploy inside of the companies. So we're not just making introductions. We're not just sitting on boards. We're actually able to kind of get our hands dirty and, and help our companies out in any way that they need. All right, so basically what I'm hearing from you is that the digital intent, which is the consulting arm, uh, effectively um, works hand-to-hand uh, -hand with this, uh, this, this uh, venture capital firm. So in That's a right. way, instead of the traditional venture capital model where you go out there and raise a fund, you've taken the consultancy and uh, available resources, uh, people as well as capital, you've deployed it to startups. Uh, and of course, you provide all the services that you would do through the consultancy, but now to the actual startups. Is that correct? It's um, the only caveat. We, we do raise money from investors. So the fund is about a $30 million fund in terms of what we've raised. Mm -hmm. um, but on top of that, uh, we also will give them um, access to team. So it's, it's both. It's a hybrid. Okay. Now, because you guys are so hands-on, uh, which is, again, very atypical of venture capitals, yeah. uh, that... It, it must put a bit of a, a constraint in terms of the number of startups they can actually cover and adequately support. Uh, yeah, so we, and that's a lesson that we, we had kind of had to learn as we went. Um, in the beginning, um, partially because we were a new fund and I think, you know, you have to build up access to deal flow and things like that. I think that the initial startups need a lot more help. And I think that we thought that we could provide a lot more help and be spread across you know, a whole bunch of initiatives. We've learned over time that our, our highest and best use is to be a little bit more surgical with how we deploy that help. Um, so for example, um, you know, we invested in a meal delivery company that is basically a logistics business in a way, or there's, there's at least a logistics component to it. Um, and we brought in some data science capability to help them optimize driver route planning and optimize meal planning uh, to maximize sort of profitability um, and they didn't need a full-time data scientist uh, and go out and try to find somebody and hire them full-time. We were able to kind of give them um, access to our team for a, you know, a six-week engagement, and then our team could kind of step out. And so while in the beginning we were, um, we were building, you know, in some cases, their entire tech stack, uh, we learned, to your point, um, our, our ability to be that materially involved is really, really hard. And it's not necessarily advantageous for the, for the founder either, um, nor is it necessarily advantageous for the, for the fund. Um, you know, stronger, as we've had more deal flow and as we've had stronger um, and stronger kind of uh, teams, we're allowed to be a little bit more picky about what, who we pick. And they're also, uh, they tend to be a little bit pickier about how they choose to, to use us. So um, what it looks like these days is um, we will train 
uh, we'll train team members and transition them over to them. Sometimes we'll plug gaps if they had a, you know, a hire that needed to kind of step away while they're trying to find a new senior level resource when it's skills that they don't need full time. Uh, you know, we have a, a, a company that basically manages kitchens for, uh, for corporate environments. Um, and it's a tech enabled business, but it is not a tech business per se. And so, you know, we help them design uh, and build their, their operator app, but they don't, they don't need necessarily a full-time CTO and a five person tech team and things like that. They're, li- they're able to be a little bit more judicious with how they allocate that capital, which allows them to put it towards other things like sales and business development and things like that. Yeah, I want to talk about uh, a couple of different uh, interesting models. One is uh, there is an emergence of this kind of a hybrid, not quite VC and not quite startup model. And basically mm-hmm. they raise a very large you know, sum, anywhere between let's say 30 to $100 million. Uh, but unlike traditional venture capital, they don't actually uh, deploy for a certain you know, percentage into the, into the company, but rather it's uh, somewhat strings, no strings attached. And what they're getting in return is essentially profit sharing. Mm-hmm. And they only invec- invest or inject capital into uh, e-commerce businesses where it shows that if you can actually prove out the microeconomics and it's just simply a matter of accelerating the sales and marketing, you can actually mm-hmm. basically have a very predictable set of revenue stream. Interesting. So that, that's a very interesting model, especially for startups. And yeah. we're starting to see more of that. The other model yeah. that's also very interesting is in New York City, one of the original founders of the VR, virtual reality meetup, uh, eventually use that platform to be able to actually create a hybrid model where they're, again, neither quite a VC, but neither quite a startup, but they'll find one or three person startup teams where they're really kind of the, you know, the engineers working on the product and they don't necessarily mm-hmm. are interested in sales or marketing or, or even know how to grow their business. They essentially yeah. absorb, absorb them into their organization where they still have autonomy, but they also have ownership into the parent company as well. So it's hmm. an interesting model where uh, they benefit from each other and they go to market together and present a yeah. portfolio of products and services that are represented by these smaller subset teams, mm-hmm. but they mm-hmm. also feel like they're being supported by the large organization. Very interesting model. Yeah. Um, so it's interesting. So speaking of innovation, one of the questions uh, yeah. I want to ask you is how should uh, innovation, see- innovation teams think like venture capital but execute like startups? So in a corporate context, um, yeah, I think um, one of the things that we've sort of learned in interacting with um, innovation groups is um, they, I think especially when the team comes from internal uh, team members versus kind of bringing an external kind of thought leadership or whatever it is, um, is they have a tendency to... um, avoid spreading risk across initiatives. So I think that, you know, they're inside of a 10, they're inside of organizations that tend to be a little bit risk averse anyway. And they, they put all of their eggs into one basket or two ideas or whatever it is, the criteria through which um, they are able to earn the resources to even do a prototype or a pilot or an MVP or whatever you want to call it is pretty high. And they, they don't spread their bets enough because as you know, um, as smart as people are in venture, one of the things we've learned is that we're really bad at picking which one of those things is going to be the winner in advance. And very often it's the one that sounded really, really crazy um, that, that nobody believed in, but you, and that ended up being the one that carries the whole fund. And so um, from an asset allocation perspective, one of the things that we try to talk about is um, create, you know, you can create stage gate processes, consider it to be, you know, you know, have it map roughly to kind of what a seed level of traction you would expect at a seed stage versus an A or whatever it is, but assume that when you're raising, when you're you're going to stand up an innovation initiative, assume that it's treat it like a venture fund, get all the money up front, um, assume an asset allocation model, report on the allocation and on the over, on the aggregate of the portfolio rather than necessarily any individual initiatives. Don't necessarily micro uh, manage any of those individual initiatives. Like you said, kind of give get a get a team together and let them run, and they know what their metrics are that they need to hit or the level of traction they need to achieve in order to unlock additional resources. Um, but treat them like seed stage startups and fully expect that that many of them aren't going to make it. That's okay. Um, 
have them fail faster, have them fail earlier, have them fail while it's cheap, um, but make progress and make forward momentum and, um, and de-risk yourself by spreading that, uh, that capital across multiple initiatives and double down on the ones that are actually working. So, so let's talk about the kind of the realities of some of the issues that larger corporate Fortune 500s have around R&D and innovation, which is that mm-hmm. uh, even if they had an innovation lab, like you said, they tend to uh, place big bets on uh, one or two and really uh, disregard or discard uh, the other concepts. Uh, mm-hmm. The other thing is, uh, if, for example, without mentioning the, the actual brands, I know a very large, very large blue chip um, you know, product manufacturers where the innovation lab based out of Palo Alto, for example, will create some incredible new concepts as well as bring in new startups. But when mm-hmm. they bring it to the parent company overseas, they're confronted with the bureaucracies. And it's a different kind of a generational gap where the people that are in the decision making place are in a position or do not often think like the way they should be thinking about these startups. So they end up kind of filtering them out and very few promising technologies and startups actually make it into the parent company portfolio. So there's yeah. those kind of issues. Um, yeah. how, do we, how do we start to help larger organizations think differently and behave differently when in fact fundamentally they are risk averse and they're more inclined to incremental innovation versus uh, disruptive innovation? Yeah, um, that's a really good question. And it's a, it is a tricky one. And in a lot of cases, it's, it's um, about trying to kind of either, either change culture beforehand, because if you don't have executive air cover to do this kind of stuff, it's not going to matter. And often you'll see that um, they'll stand up an innovation group. They'll either bring in somebody from the outside or hire someone internally and give them what they believe to be their mandate, but then find out that they don't actually have um, the executive, you know, behind them to the degree that they thought that they did, or they don't actually have access to some of the resources that they need, or to your point, they find out that their risk tolerance after the fact is not what they thought it would be. And so making sure when you stand these things up that you've been really clear, is this, is the mandate for this group to pursue, like you said, you know, more incremental back office stuff, in which case you're, the, the exercises that you're doing are a lot different. You're probably spending a lot more time talking to internal team members, kind of mapping their journeys and how they do their jobs and looking for, you know, little 3%, 5% lifts, maybe building point solutions on top of, of platforms like Salesforce or SAP or whatever it is that they're already using. Um, or is it more of a disruptive, you know, new business model type of mandate, in which case um, you probably want to keep the team a little bit more um, uh, closed off from the internal apparatus. You want to make sure that you arm them with the resources from a capital and a team perspective that they need. You make sure that you avoid some of the red tape that there maybe would otherwise have had to deal with from a, from a procurement perspective and from a legal and from an IT perspective and just give them the, the rein to kind of just go. And again, you know, you report and you manage it at the portfolio level um, and you give them kind of clear criteria for what constitutes progress, but um, give them a lot more freedom. And I think the other thing, and you brought up an interesting point around like when, you've, when it's time to absorb it into the mothership, <laughs> I think you're seeing a lot of organizations realizing that they need to do stuff like this, and they're doing design thinking workshops and design sprints and all those kind of hackathons and all those kinds of things, and they think that, that their biggest problem is going kind of from zero to one, to get to like an MVP. And, and so they're trying to train the team to do like rapid prototyping exercises and, and you, know, uh, cut, you know, user-centered design processes and that kind of stuff. And that's all great and that's important. And if they don't have that yet, that's, that's great. Um, what, I, what we are seeing though is a flawed assumption in my mind around when you should absorb, bring something back into the mothership or even if you should bring it back into the mothership. Because um, as we've seen a number of times, um, the second something starts to get traction, now you start running into some political issues internally of like who wants to take credit for it. Um, an IT apparatus that had, had zero interest in participating in it when it was this fledgling idea, now that they see it's got traction, now they're starting to wanna kind of wrap their arms around it and um, have it go into their you know, release cadences and have it go into their normal way of doing things. And as I'm sure you know, I mean, um, as hard as it is to go from zero to one, 
you're still not out of the weeds. Once you've kind of found that proverbial sort of product market fit and now it's time to scale, you need to move even faster and you need to be willing to take, have things like code debt and you need to be willing to kind of hire a lot of like the blitz scaling sort of ideas that, that they talk about. Um, enterprise organizations, um, they're, they're, they don't just need help going from zero to one. They actually need help too uh, when you're trying to really kind of drive scale and drive really, really rapid growth. And I think a lot of times they bring it in too early and it really chokes the life out of something that maybe had promise. Um, and, and, and so those are, those are some of the thoughts and some of the ways that we, that we some of the things that we've seen and, and how you could potentially sort of mitigate it. I don't know if that answered your question or not. Great, thanks, Sean. Uh, we only have a couple of minutes remaining. So we sure. always ask on this show uh, two questions, which is what was your greatest product innovation failure and what uh, were the lessons learned? So I know you were, for example, with Real Street, uh, Gold Quest, Education Dynamics, as well as uh, startups that you've, uh, you've uh, overseen. Yeah. Share with us. So um, the one that kind of comes to mind is it was one of our earlier investments, and it was, it was basically a, um, a niche-based um, Q&A social network on mobile. So the idea was... Q&A platforms, forums, things like that have been around for a long time. They're very, very sticky. Um, they did not make the transition from, uh, from web to mobile very well. And so that was sort of the hypothesis. And they started with a niche um, that was targeting first-time moms. And the team was really, really good at acquisition. So um, very aggressive about testing creative, testing targeting, testing channel, all of those sorts of things. And they found a path to... Um, very, very low cost acquisition. And um, they mistook that for product market fit. And um, what they didn't realize and what we didn't see until it was, until it was too late was, uh, you know, if you, if you visualize like a retention curve, you know, you, you, you know, you see drop off. It looks almost like a reverse power law in a way. Um, but as long as it tapers, eventually you're okay. Um, it wasn't tapering and it took, you know, six months, nine months to sort of realize that literally everybody's dropping off of the bottom of the funnel there. And so they used cheap acquisition as justification for kind of trying to drive some scale. And from a reporting perspective, in order to show that chart that's sort of going up into the right on a consistent basis, like you have to keep plowing more and more money into something uh, if you have a churn problem like that. And so um, I think the lesson for me was um, cheap paid acquisition can be a crutch and it can be really intoxicating um, because you can, you know, once you find that formula that works, you can just light it up and scale it until you, until you saturate the channel basically. Um, and if you, if you mistake that for actual product market fit as measured by long-term retention, you know, and there's leading indicators around stuff like that. Like you could use MPS, you could use, you know, organic referral. There's things that you can do there, but, um, mistaking uh, low cost to acquire a user for product market fit and using that as justification for premature scaling uh, was a big lesson that we learned kind of the hard way. Great, uh, great example. Thank you, Sean. I appreciate that. Yeah. So today I've been joined by Sean Johnson, partner at Founder Equity, as well as at Digital Intent. Sean, thank you for joining. Yeah, it was great. Thank you.